Beneath the veneer of skepticism, reality bears witness to chilling truths. In the haunting corridors of history, where shadows dance with undeniable evidence, remember this, the stories are true. Prepare for a revelation. Where the supernatural is stripped of fiction, and the unknown is laid bare, are you ready to confront the undeniable? The stories are true, and the echoes of reality await. All right, buckle up, because I've got a double dose of spookiness and hilarity for you straight from the annals of Yorkshire's most haunted pub, the Black Swan. First up, we've got this ancient joint that's been standing tall for over 500 years in Helmsley. It's not just your run-of-the-mill pub, it's also a posh hotel and a Michelin-starred restaurant. Now, picture this. You're sitting down for a fancy dinner, minding your own business, and suddenly you catch sight of an old dude in a swanky suit strolling past your table. No, it's not your uncle who's had one too many drinks. It's one of the resident ghosts just doing their thing. And if that's not enough to give you the heebie-jeebies, imagine hearing mysterious noises in your room while you're trying to catch some Zs. Talk about a sodden-witted ghostly encounter. But wait, there's more. The Black Swan doesn't just serve up fine dining and eerie ambience. It's also got its own roster of spectral regulars. Picture this. A bloke in a bowler hat who looks like he's been stood up at the bar only to vanish into thin air. Then there's this smoking hot ghost bride who's just chilling by the fire, waiting to give unsuspecting blokes the shock of their lives with a fatal gaze. And don't even get me started on little Matthew, the Victorian pickpocket ghost who's probably nicking your wallet as we speak. Oh, and let's not forget about Jack the Highwayman, who's belting out Irish folk tunes in the kitchen like he's auditioning for Ghost Idol. And if you think you're safe from spectral shenanigans just because you're not in the bar, think again. There's a cursed chair lurking by the fire, waiting to cast its spooky spell on anyone brave enough to take a seat. And if that's not enough to send you running for the hills, there's a pair of ghostly legs making a break for it up the stairs, and a clay pipe that gives the builders the chills whenever they try to ditch it. Looks like the Black Swan is serving up more than just pints and pies. It's dishing out a healthy dose of ghostly giggles along with your meal. Hey, so let me hit you with a couple of wild stories I stumbled upon. First up, we've got this real doozy about a ghost train that vanished into thin air back in 1911. Picture this. The train, called Zanetti, was chugging along with 106 passengers on board minding its own business. But then, bam, it enters this tunnel in Lombard, and poof, gone without a trace, except for two lucky souls who managed to bail out at the last second. Talk about a close call. Now here's where it gets creepy. Those survivors? They swear up and down that just before the train vanished, things got real weird. People on board started acting all erratic, shouting and freaking out like there's no tomorrow. And to top it off, the whole train was enveloped in this eerie, milk-white mist that kept getting thicker and thicker. Spooky, right? And get this, no one could find a single shred of evidence that the train ever existed. Not a trace of soot, no passengers, Nada. It's like it vanished into thin air, remorseless as can be. But wait, there's more. Turns out this train wasn't content with just disappearing once. Nope, it decided to go on a world tour of vanishing acts. People in places like Russia, India, Germany, Italy, and Romania all claim to have seen it. In Italy, some saint wrote about stumbling upon a freaky dark tube made of steel filled with strangely dressed folks from who knows when. And get this, 104 Italians mysteriously pop up in Mexico in 1845, claiming they're from Rome, but their gear is straight out of a time capsule. And just when you think it couldn't get any weirder, in Russia, folks swear they saw this phantom train cruising along tracks that weren't even there mowing down chickens like it's nobody's business. And then, in 1955, at a railway station in Poltava, India, the same train reappears, and some poor soul gets sucked into it right in front of a crowd. Talk about being in the wrong place at the wrong time. So, what's the deal with this train? Beats me. Even after World War II blew up the Lombard Tunnel, we're still scratching our heads trying to figure out where it went and why it keeps popping up like a ghost with a serious case of wanderlust. Spooky stuff, my friend. Spooky stuff indeed. So, 
picture this, you're strolling through Hull, minding your own business, when you spot this ominous red brick building. Or yes, the Anison Funeral Parlour, but hold on to your hat, because nowadays it's transformed into a late night pharmacy. Talk about a spooky makeover, am I right? Now, you'd think with the place now selling medicine instead of burying folks, things would be all sunshine and rainbows. But oh no, my friend, the stories of ghostly shenanigans are still as rampant as ever. The pharmacy staff, well, they're like a bunch of taddy gated tittles when it comes to venturing past the first floor or poking their noses into those abandoned rooms from the funeral parlor days. Can you blame them though? This place has more skeletons in its closet than a haunted mansion. And speaking of skeletons, let me tell you about Mary Jane Langley, the poor soul who met her untimely demise after a visit to this very building. Back in 1891, she popped in to see a photographer there, probably to get her portrait done or something. But after leaving, she vanished into thin air, only to turn up later with her throat slit. Yikes. Now, the cops had their suspects, including a guy with ties to Jack the Ripper, but nobody got pinned for the crime. Legend has it that Mary Jane's ghost still roams the halls of the Anison Funeral Parlor, scaring the daylights out of anyone who dares to wander too far. The stories don't stop there, oh no, even the pharmacy crew have had their fair share of spooky encounters. I'm talking ghostly apparitions, disembodied voices, and footsteps that will make your hair stand on end. And get this, the folks from Most Haunted even paid a visit once. They tried chatting up Mary Jane's spirit, but all they got were some bumps and groans. Plus, there's this footage of a chair sliding across the floor all by itself. Can you say chills? So, next time you're in Hull and you happen to stroll past that old pharmacy, just remember, you might not be alone. And who knows, you might just catch a glimpse of Mary Jane herself, still haunting the place after all these years. Alright, gather round folks, because I've got a tale straight out of Pepperell, Massachusetts, and it's a roller coaster of spooky seances, teenage angst, and a villain straight out of a horror flick. In the quaint town of Pepperell, Massachusetts, young Tina Bowen found herself embroiled in an enigma. It seemed that her late mother's spirit had found a way to communicate, reaching out from the beyond through the very walls of their home. Over weeks, Tina would discover cryptic messages inscribed in vibrant swaths of ordinary ketchup. Around her, the house appeared to be in constant flux, with items mysteriously relocating of their own will. Even more puzzlingly, unopened bottles of alcohol would spontaneously find themselves drained. Such were the paranormal phenomena that Tina was convinced were the doing of her beloved departed mother. Picture this. It's December 8, 1986. Bowen and her father returned home, only to be greeted by a sight that sent shivers down their spine. Hiding in their closet was an alien figure. Imagine the sight of face obscured by paint, clothed in a Native American-style jacket. It wore a ninja mask and held a hatchet in hand. A bone-chilling moment that would be forever etched in their memory. He forced the Bowens into a bedroom before running off into another part of the home, Tina used the opportunity to escape and call the police. Authorities arrived and found that the stranger was a teenager named Daniel LaPlante, whom Tina had briefly dated, and he had been living in the family's crawl space for several weeks, taunting them all the while. Unfortunately, this creepy story doesn't end here. LaPlante would later go on to brutally murder a young teacher and her two children while he was out on bail for the Bowen family incident. At first, LaPlante only planned to burglarize the home of the Gustafsson family in November and December 1987, but he was caught off guard on December 1st when Priscilla Gustafsson and her children came home early. LaPlante later said that he had considered jumping out the window and escaping, but instead he opted to confront Priscilla, aiming a gun at her and leading her and her five-year-old son William to a bedroom. There, he forced William into a closet and tied Priscilla to a bed, gagging her with a sock. He raped Priscilla, then shot her twice in the head. Afterward, he took William into the bathroom and drowned him. And when seven-year-old Abigail Gustafson returned home just as LaPlante was leaving, he led the young girl to another bathroom and drowned her too. Just two fleeting days after the crime took place, LaPlante was implicated, his ties to the scene undeniable. The gears of justice began to turn swiftly. When October 1988 rolled in, it brought with it the weight of his actions laid bare during the trial. 
A collective consensus emerged from the jury Laplante was unequivocally guilty of murder. The impact of the verdict echoed through the courtroom as he was dealt three life sentences, permanently closing the chapter on this gruesome tale. So, let me tell you about Bowling Hall in Bradford. This place is like a time machine back to the 14th century, but instead of finding knights in shining armor, you'll encounter 20 restless spirits roaming around like they're rehearsing for the ghostly Olympics. Legend has it that even the Blue Room isn't safe from these spectral shenanigans. Visitors have claimed to see a dude in a long coat just chilling by the fireplace, giving off Major Bo Yang vibes, and don't get me started on the white lady floating around in her period attire, probably trying to find her way to a ghostly ball or something. But the real kicker, the constant sound of a crying baby echoing through the hallways like a never-ending lullaby from beyond. But wait, it gets spookier. Back in 1643, during the whole Earl of Newcastle debacle, things got real weird. Picture this, the Earl waking up in the dead of night, only to find his bedsheets yanked off by an otherworldly force. And who's standing there wringing her hands and muttering about pitying poor Bradford? None other than our friendly neighborhood ghost lady. Talk about a wake-up call. Now, you'd think after an encounter like that, the Earl would have a change of heart, right? Well, you're spot on. Instead of going full-on medieval on Bradford, he decides to take it easy and orders his troops to go easy on the town folk. Only 10 casualties. That's practically a ghostly intervention. And it's not just the Earl who's had his fair share of paranormal experiences. The most haunted team once caught a crib rocking on its own during an investigation. I mean, forget about baby monitors. We've got ghostly babysitters here. And the blue room strikes again. Staff are so spooked they avoid it like the plague, claiming they feel like they're being watched. No wonder, with a creepy dude in a black coat lurking around and a floating lady in white playing hide-and-seek with the fireplace. But the fun doesn't stop there. Doors opening and closing on their own, disembodied voices chatting away, footsteps stomping down empty corridors. Bowling Hall is basically a haunted house party, and everyone's invited to get their spook on. Hold tight for the next one. This. You're strolling through St. Louis minding your own business, when suddenly you come face to face with the hell-hated Lemp Mansion. Now this place ain't your average haunted house. Oh no, it's like the granddaddy of all spooky dwellings in America. Legend has it that this mansion was built by Adam Johann Lemp, the beer baron who basically made lager-style beer a thing in the US. Now this guy wasn't content with just brewing beer. He had to store it in an underground cave system beneath the city. Talk about keeping your brews cool without modern refrigeration. But it was his son, William Lemp, who turned this place into the stuff of nightmares. In the 1860s, William decides he wants to be closer to his beer-making operation, so he builds this foreboding house right over those creepy caves. Can you smell the haunting already? But hold on to your hats, folks, because the real drama kicks in during the new millennium. Well, the 1900s version, that is. William's life takes a nosedive when his favorite son, Frederick, kicks the bucket thanks to tuberculosis. And it doesn't end there. William himself meets his end in the most tragic way possible. Suicide. His wife, Julia, follows suit, dying of cancer right there in the mansion. Fast forward a bit, and things go from bad to worse for the Lemps. William Jr., who's been trying to keep the family business afloat during Prohibition, decides life ain't worth living and follows in his old man's footsteps shooting himself in the same room where his dad died. But wait, there's more. Another brother, Charles, goes full-on bizarre, shooting his own dog in the basement before offing himself in his room. And just when you think the Lemp family couldn't possibly get any more cursed, the youngest surviving sibling, Edwin, sells the house. But instead of ridding the place of its spooky vibes, it becomes a hotbed for hauntings. Nowadays, the Lemp mansion isn't just a creepy old house. It's a restaurant and inn where you can dine with the dearly departed, attend murder mystery dinners, or even go ghost hunting. Who needs Netflix when you've got a real-life horror show right here in St. Louis? Howdy folks, ever heard of the Midland Hotel, the grand old dame of Bradford? 
Erected in the 1800s, it's more than just a swanky place for a midnight feast. It practically holds the title for Yorkshire's creepiest hotel. Enjoy the five-star spooks. In 1905, and you're not gonna believe this, Bram Stoker. Yeah, the very chap who penned Dracula decided to hit up the Midland Hotel. He was there to cheer on his friend, Sir Henry Irving, who was performing at the Theater Royal. I mean, who wouldn't want to support a friend who could probably play the lead in your vampire novel if he wasn't so darn alive? Well, that's where the fun starts. Now, Bram Stoker, the mastermind behind Dracula, he's not just any old friend of Irving's. He's a literary genius who probably knew a thing or two about spooking people out. So when he decides to pay a visit to his pal Irving at the Midland Hotel, you can bet it's going to be one heck of a story. Imagine Bram sitting there in the audience at the Theater Royal, probably getting all excited about seeing his buddy perform. But then, just as the curtains fall and the applause rings out, disaster strikes. Irving collapses right then and there from a stroke. And before anyone can even bat an eyelash, he's gone. Talk about a showstopper, huh? Now fast forward to today, and Irving's spirit is still hanging around the Midland Hotel like an old theater ghost who refuses to take his final bow. People swear they've seen him drifting through the halls, his figure obscured by a mysterious smoky haze. It's like something straight out of one of Bram Stoker's own chilling tales. So next time you find yourself booking a room at the Midland Hotel, keep your eyes peeled and your wits about you. You never know when you might bump into Sir Henry Irving's ghostly presence, ready to give you a scare that'll send shivers down your spine. And hey, if you do happen to run into him, maybe ask him for some tips on how to write a killer ghost story. After all, who better to learn from than the ghost of a legendary actor, right? <laughs> All right, buckle up, because this tale takes more twists and turns than a Lombard Street joyride. Picture this. Patricia Montandon, the queen bee of San Francisco society, residing in her posh pad on the famous crooked block, Lombard Street. Life was all champagne and caviar until she decides to throw the mother of all theme parties, an astrology extravaganza that would make the stars themselves jealous. Now here's where things start to get as twisted as Lombard Street itself. According to Patricia's tell-all memoir, the intruders. After that fateful night, her apartment turns into something straight out of a horror flick. We're talking eerie laughter echoing through the halls, ghostly tunes playing on an endless loop, and drafts so cold they'd make a penguin shiver. And let's not forget those mysterious footsteps, strutting around like they own the place, even when every door and window is locked tighter than a clamshell. But hold on to your hats, because the spooky shenanigans don't stop there. Oh no, Patricia soon finds herself the target of some real-life crime capers. We're talking burglaries, harassment that would make a telemarketer blush, and fires so suspicious they'd make even Sherlock Holmes raise an eyebrow. And then, just when you thought it couldn't get any crazier, tragedy strikes. A fire breaks out in the apartment, claiming not one, not two, but three lives of Patricia's closest pals, all of whom had spent time in the cursed abode between 68 and 69, it's like something straight out of a Shakespearean tragedy, but with more ghostly whispers and less iambic pentameter. But Patricia isn't one to sit back and let the ghosts have all the fun. Oh no, she rolls up her sleeves, grabs her magnifying glass, and sets off on her own Nancy Drew-style investigation to uncover the truth behind the curse of 1000 Lombard Street talk about a socialite turned ghostbuster. So, picture this. You're strolling through Yorkshire, minding your own business, when suddenly you get hit with the urge for a pint. la di da right? But not just any pint, oh no. You want an experience, an adventure, a chance to rub elbows with some otherworldly patrons. Well, my friend, look no further than the Fleece Inn. This place has been serving up spirits, both the liquid and ghostly kind, for over 400 years. And let me tell you, it's not just your run-of-the-mill pub. Nope, the Fleece Inn is practically a paranormal theme park with more ghost stories than a campfire at midnight. We're talking murders, secret tunnels, headless horsemen, the whole shebang. Now if you're thinking, but why would I want to drink in a haunted pub? Well, let me tell you, it's not just about the booze, it's about the thrill, the excitement of wondering whether that pint you ordered might come with a side of ectoplasm. 
and hey, if you're lucky, you might even catch a glimpse of some spectral patrons waiting to be served. Just don't be surprised if you see faces popping up in the window like they're auditioning for a ghostly cameo. But enough about the spooks, let's talk history. The Fleece Inn, formerly known as Great House Farm, has been around since the 17th century. And let me tell you, it's seen some stuff. From fights ending in murder to handprints that just won't wash away, this place is like a living or maybe not so living history book. And as for the residents? Well, let's just say they're a lively bunch. There's Elena, the balloon-loving ghost girl who just can't resist crashing our parties. Then there's Harold, the cantankerous spirit who's always in a rush to clear out the function room. I swear, if you linger too long, he'll give you a ghostly tap on the shoulder and shoo you right out the door. But hey, don't take my word for it. Come on down to the Fleece Inn and see for yourself. Who knows, maybe you'll leave with more than just a hangover like a first-hand ghost story to tell at your next dinner party. Want to enjoy a pint at what might be one of the most haunted pubs in Britain, never mind Yorkshire? Well, the Fleece Inn is the place to be. For over 400 years, the building has been a hotspot for paranormal activity, with reports of murders, secret tunnels, and even headless horsemen. The current landlady claims paranormal happenings occur at least twice a week, whether it be a glass falling off a shelf or members of staff getting a mysterious tap on the shoulder. Visit for a drink and you might just see faces popping up in the window or ghostly customers waiting to be served. So imagine this. You're cruising down the Hudson River, right? You pass by this picturesque Queen Anne house, the kind that just screams classic charm. But hold on to your hats because this place ain't your typical cozy home. Nope. It's the Ackley House, aka Ghost Central. Back in the day, the Ackley family lived there, and apparently they had more than just your average house guests. We're talking about friendly ghosts roaming around shaking beds to wake you up in the morning. Can you imagine? It's like having your own personal alarm clock from the afterlife. Now these ghostly pals weren't stingy either. They'd leave little gifts behind like these mysterious baby rings. But here's the kicker. Those rings would mysteriously vanish into thin air. Just like that. Talk about a disappearing act. And get this, the ghosts were even helpful during renovations. Helen Ackley swore they were supervising her painting sessions. Can you imagine trying to choose a paint color while being watched by an otherworldly audience? I'd be flummoxed for sure. But here's where things get juicy. The Ackleys decided to sell the house, and along comes the Stambovsky family, totally clueless about the paranormal activity. Cue the legal drama. The Stambovskys find out the house is haunted and decide they want out faster than you can say boo. Can't blame them, especially with a pregnant wife in the mix. So they try to bail and it turns into a legal showdown dubbed the Ghostbusters ruling. Picture this, the New York Supreme Court, weighing in on whether ghosts should be listed alongside leaky roofs and rodent infestations in property disclosures. Classic case of buyer beware meets spectral surprises. And guess what? The court ruled in favor of the Stambovskys, declaring the house legally haunted. Can you believe it? Only in New York, folks. So, the Stambovskys walked away with half their down payment, probably relieved they didn't end up with ghostly roommates. But hey, since then, the Ackley House has become a celebrity hotspot. Even musician Ingrid Michaelson called it home sweet haunted home. Moral of the story? When house hunting, keep an eye out for more than just a good deal. You never know who or what might be lurking in the shadows. Thanks for joining us on this eerie adventure. If you enjoyed the chills, don't forget to subscribe. More mysteries await. Until next time, thanks for watching and stay curious. Thank <laughs> you.